It's just you and me, brother. That's right. That's right. So, so look, you you were out doing events, hosting a small small uh, groups of people. Uh, I remember seeing you here in Seattle um, with a few CROs and um, uh, and 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 teaching, you know, teaching, dropping some knowledge. So, what what are you seeing? Like, what are the things that are top of mind right now? Well, Versus- you know, um, not to be too doom and gloom, but I can only relay uh, what I hear from the front lines. Yep. And it's definitely, you know, I think there was a period uh, at the beginning of 2023 through the first half of 2023 when people felt like um, I'm going to make the difficult decisions. I'm going to make the tough cuts, but but uh, it'll be over uh, by the end of the year. And then we can get back to, you know, the growth and the environment that we were used to from, you know, really ending in sort of like uh, the middle of 2022. I think, you know, the public market peak was November of 2021. But so there was this a little bit of hope uh, within the revenue community that things would begin to get materially better. And I think from Q2 to Q3, we've seen a little bit of improvement in terms of like B2B sales, but generally speaking, it's pretty it's pretty rough out there. And so, so what am I seeing? I'm seeing, um, you know, and uh, I had a slide in the in the presentation that I gave at Unleash, but Carta has reported that through uh, the first half of 2023, at least, net headcount in venture capital backed companies, or at least companies that are managing their cap table on Carta, has yeah. decreased steadily every month. So that means like the industry is contracting. I know that G2 reported recently that uh, the number of software companies has gone from 50,000 that are listed on G2 in like 2019 to 125,000 uh, as of this year. So the number of vendors, the number of solutions has uh, dramatically increased while the efficacy of traditional go-to-market motions has really decreased. And so Jeremy Donovan released this data that uh, it used to take between two to 400 uh, aggregate touches to create an opportunity, and it now takes 1,000 to 1,400. Mm-hmm. So the problem is that traditional outbound, as it's been defined over really from 2009 to you know 2023, is showing material signs of fundamentally being broken. And the consequence of that uh, is, and in the meanwhile, of course, we've got you know uh, higher interest rates. We've got Jerome Powell saying that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer than people want. And we're, I think we're in a sort of a period of almost capitulation. There are, so first of all, I talked to a lot of people that are out of work, right? There's a lot of revenue leaders that are just out of work. Uh, There are more fractional revenue leaders than at any time I've ever seen. You know, it sort of feels like everybody's trying to be a consultant because people have been burned by trying to be full-time employees. It doesn't mean it's still most people are trying to do that, but I think the number of fractionals has has materially increased. And, um, and valuations are down, as we know. And so the consequence is we're moving from this period of growth at any cost to, I mean, we're in it, to grow, to efficient growth. Efficient growth just means, uh, and efficient growth really means, especially for, you know, early stage founders, it, what the, the, everybody nods when they hear that, but that what they don't understand is, yeah, that means you're probably, efficient growth means you can't spend all the money that you have to try and triple next year. And that um, you might have to accept more traditional growth rates for companies like 20, 30, 40, 50%, as opposed to 100, 200%. And that the idea that all of our valuations are gonna be determined by triple, twice, double, three times is gonna be, again, those measurements, those metrics relied in many ways over the last 15 years on free money, on 0% interest rates. and. So I just think a lot of our benchmarks are broken. And I think we're moving into a world where companies are going to say, listen, whether I IPO next year or not, I want to have a a company in 10 years. And that means that I've got to be really, really focused on flowing leads to my top reps, probably reducing the size of my headcount as it relates to the entire go-to-market motion, accepting a lower top line growth rate for much better uh, profitability metrics and efficiency metrics. So- it's not how, great, how, how does that how does that play out for the employees and the founders? Like, if I want to have a company in ten years, the the turnover is like you know you start and it's usually the holding period for a VC is ten years, and the ones that are coming into this period have already been held by three years or four years. 
So 10 years between now and actually, you know, something nice happening in your life, it's a long period to wait. So why do you think it's going to happen to the employee base, to the... I think we're going to see a massive shakeout. I think we're going to see a massive shakeout in the startup ecosystem. And there's really going to be, uh, there, there's going to be that the haves and have not, I think, you know, money companies are going to reprice their equity, right? Yeah. There's, so we can talk about down rounds and all that other stuff, but there's fundamentally two kinds of companies that are venture backed. Or right. maybe there's three. There's one kind of company which has a valuation that'll take a long time to grow into, but they still have a massive balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. Those companies, relatively speaking, it's not the end of the world to be in that position, even if the board is really frustrated that effectively they overpaid over the last couple of years. <laughs> there's you still get to be a company. You know, if you have a hundred million dollars on your balance sheet, you can cut your burn. And yeah. yes, you might accept lower growth rates, but at least you get to be a company. Then there's companies that are much earlier stage that are still they're still fundamentally focused on like I I've had a couple conversations with CEOs of like five, 10, 15 million ARR companies. And uh, they're like, we got to hit Q4 so we can raise in Q1. And if we don't hit our numbers in Q4, then we might need to do like a down round. And that that desperation, in my experience, typically does not translate to sustainable performance. And I think investors are pretty cautious right now. So yeah. the second kind of company is companies with uh, a fragile balance sheet that are also overvalued. And those companies are in a lot of trouble. And um, they're going to, and I think the employees are going to feel the most pain because it's still better to be a founder and you still have a lot more control and leverage than the employees. But I think a lot of employees that are working at startups for the value of the upside of the equity are going to recognize that that is no longer available to them. So and then are, you, are you seeing companies uh, taking down their valuation internally, like their 409A, so that employees can get in at a lower price? Yes. Uh, the actual yes. Price of the company? I am seeing that. And then the thing that they're not always telling their employees is that they're taking, they might be doing down rounds or repricing the equity, but they might be giving uh, preferences to new investors yeah. that obscure the re. So the employee thinks, oh, my strike price is now five cents when it used to be 30 cents. That's great. Let me do some math on the valuation, not understanding that like the last investor has a two and a half X lick preference. That means that like you're way underwater, no matter what the price of the common stock options yeah. are. I think it's actually a little bit worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think I I uh, I had a, I had dinner with a with a with a private with a public fund. Then he was telling me that you know he invests directly in companies and he invested in, in VCs and other funds. And he's saying the VCs are starting to clean shop, meaning if I invested in you and I gave you I don't know fifty million dollars last year valuation X, I am asking for that money back if you're not worth that much. And and there is no direct mechanism to do it other than forcing a sale. You know, and getting some of the cash out, but it's not. It's 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 a bit more dire than than meets the eye because, look, if you are if you're a hedge fund, if you are a VC, and you put you know money into something that is really not that value that much, and you get to go to the board meeting every quarter to remind yourself, you know how how over much you overpaid. Those are not like great conversations. You know what I mean? Like you're not talking about a viable business in ten years because the VC does not have ten years. Or like the hedge fund that's not half ten years, they may have five. You see what I mean? So they're I, on that. I only want to underscore what you're saying because I have a real life anecdote from when I was in Seattle. I won't say more than that, but literally the company was actually performing well and they were hitting their growth targets. And the VC said, "You're just so far out of the money. We're shutting this whole thing down." And it was it was uh -huh. wild. Yeah, and they and they weren't even there. There wasn't an I. And it was some really weird board dynamics, but that's the other thing that's happening because this is going up and down the value chain. So it's not just companies where VCs are in trouble too. You know, their LPs, their shakeouts at, and there's a meaningful argument to be made or or a significant argument to be made that growth equity investing is is permanently or not permanently, but materially uh, hobbled. You know, is is impaired. Yeah. I, so there's lots of activity in seed and pre-seed, but but there's a lot of growth stage funds, and I'm sure maybe some of the folks that you were talking to, and you know Tiger Global and the hedge funds that that were writing massive massive checks for Series B and Series C, and they're taking massive massive write downs, and there's there's also going to be fewer GPs, there's going to be fewer funds, um, which you know makes it feel like 
the thing that I come back to is, you know, Fred Wilson always talks about how there's like a, a capital, the, the size of the, uh, you know, the total assets under management for the venture industry is not correlated to the number of great companies that are created and that the number of great companies that are created is fairly static on a year over year basis, but the amount of capital is not static. And so there was just company, there was money sinking too many companies, too many average companies, too many bad companies, and we're dealing with the fallout. The, um, the, the, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I think that we haven't seen bottom yet. And, and uh, I think we still have to brace for more, more of what you said. And I think it's going to come in all at once. And, you know, it's funny because I was, I was thinking about writing, about writing a look, a blog post about this uh, or a LinkedIn post in that I get a company pitching, I get a p- company pitch per week and sometimes two per week. I used to get one a quarter. I used to get like one every six months. A company pitch saying, please buy me. Yes. Company <laughs> saying, please buy me. Yeah. Or, or, you know, or, 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 you know, the synergies could be tremendous or, or great team, poor execution, or look at all this tech that they built. And if they only had, you know, um, the distribution muscle of a bigger company, you know, they will be doing so much better. And I get one of those a week at this point. And it's really interesting because I was going to write a post saying, Hey, if you have great tech, go sell it. Like go, like go find customers. Like there is no such thing as a free lunch in selling is hard. It's harder now than it was before. I know, but it's a, it's a, the worst time to sell is when everybody else is selling. So if, if you have a praying hope of staying around, go stay around. Like there is, this is not a great time to sell. The VCs or, or, or some, or, or your, take, take away the, the name, right? Like the, whoever funded you is treating you like a trade. You see what I mean? When yeah. you, you usually cut your losses or things are going down, you see, I mean, saving the dry powder when things go up again. Unfortunately, all this illiquidity doesn't exist. You know, all this equity doesn't exist. And you're dealing with real, you know, real humans, real companies here. So the uh, there is there is no such thing as just paring down the losses of the of the people who are not performing. If you have good tech, go save, you know, go save yourself by selling some more. And or pivot into something that is actually needed. But right now it's not a good time to sell. It doesn't matter what your financial partner tells you to do. It's not a great time to go out and, and get money from anybody else. A hundred percent. And you know, it's always human psychology. The fact that you want to sell is probably an indicator that it's a bad time to sell exactly. because when you don't want to sell and you have an asset that you feel is worth a lot, that's when people are interested. And even for my company, you know, we raised money two years ago and spent it foolishly and immediately became an unprofitable business. And yep. so for next year, I'm modeling, I'm not even modeling much growth, to be honest. All I'm modeling is 20% EBITDA margins. I'm just saying whatever we need to do to be profitable, I can't focus obsessively. Like there's no market, slow growth, burning lots of capital. It's, you know, to the point of, you know, your advice to those founders, they might say, oh, it's worth like X. It's like, no, it's worth zero. It's, it's worth not zero. worth anything at all. Yeah. So like you have to find a way to survive. I completely agree with you. You know, I, uh, and, and, and it, to be more sanguine, um, I met with eight CEOs last week. And we talked about consolidation and, and yes, in every single industry, there's going to be, there's a lot of players. So the, you, you say that about MarTech or cell technology and like, there's a lot of industry players in every single one of the verticals. Like it's not just us. And in every single one of them, there is a big one and a bunch of small ones. And, 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 this, and the feeling in the room was that we don't have to consolidate right now. Things are going to get way cheaper in Q1 and Q2. So we can just sit this market out and then either get it cheaper or just pick up the pieces once it falls through. So it, like the dynamic in the market are becoming very capitalistic in that in that nobody has to pull the trigger. You can see that things are getting cheaper. So not, why not wait until things are cheaper? This is why it's bad to sell right now. Because like the potential buyers are just waiting for things to get cheaper. So that's why, you know, so then if you're if you're out there and you're like, well, what should I do? You know, the thing that my, my main advice is almost psychological, which is, you have, we can't, for me, right? For me, this has been the hardest year uh, running pavilion of any of the years uh, that I've been doing it. And, you know, just like everybody, I felt like I was a genius go on the way up. And then I feel, I, I feel sorry talking into it, man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no way. I stay doing the other thing. <laughs> it, was still, it was still the best decision I ever made. And I still have that email from you uh, somewhere in my inbox. I'll forward it to you after this. Okay. But, um, but my point is like, 
I can't, we can't do another year like this. And, and I, I don't mean from, I mean, from a, a psychological perspective, we can't white knuckle our way to some, to your point, to some acquirer magically writing in and saying, you're saved. Here's a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars or whatever it is. And so we have to be really intentional about how we design our lives and our companies so that we can make it fun again, you know, so that we can make sure that people are having fun, that we're not constantly walking around saying, oh, we're so terrible. Oh, things are such shit, but that instead we've designed it. And that's why I'm so focused on profitability because yeah. I run a community and the community feels it when I'm desperate, you know, there's discounting, there's, there's uh, no, not giving, you know, refunds. There's like being really aggressive on auto renewals. Like the, the community feels it when we are in a posture of weakness versus strength. Whereas if we're profitable, I don't need to discount. I can focus more on the member experience. I don't need to grow in any particular rate. Now for me, that means like accepting to a certain extent that like, maybe we're not really like a venture company. Maybe we're more of a private equity company, but Again, the the bottom line for me is like if I'm profitable, I don't have to worry about any of that because yeah. I don't face an existential threat of having to shut down, you know, in the next six to nine months. See, I I, I don't think that there is. We should we should stop doing uh uh what you just did of like calling VC versus private equity. That you know, it's gonna be rare to see the triple triple double double uh in in in, the, in this current market where the money is much much more expensive, and. You know, we're just building companies, whether you're, you know, PC backed or public or, you know, privately held by whoever, uh, you still have to be profitable because otherwise it's your point, right? You're worth zero. Like if you have 20% growth and you're burning, you know, you know, you're, you're ne negative maybe that 20%, you're, you're not worth much. You know what I mean? All I have to do is wait. You know what I mean? Kind of like, exactly. Kind of, exactly. Kind of like a little vulture is going around and eventually you fall and you will be delicious. So the, uh, the the you have to focus on on building a business, and it's interesting because um, you know my team was asking me what are my predictions for next year, and I, I'm curious to hear your your point of view. One of the things that I'm attuned to is the fact that this year was incredibly hard, and we have another one coming. I don't think that the the bottom falls off until probably late next year. So I don't know that things get much better until maybe late next year. Who knows? Um, how many people are going to stay in the game? the way the game is played right now. And how many people is it going to be? I'm out. I'm just going back to, you know, big company, write this out and wait it out. I, I'm a little more optimistic than you on next year. Um, I definitely think right now and Q1 are, I'm calling them, you know, a period of capitulation. You were holding out hope, you know, all the, the CEOs I was talking about, we're going to have a great Q4 and then we'll raise in Q1. Maybe. But but uh, this is going to be finally people say I surrender and I accept the new reality, whatever that is. I accept that my company's worth fifty million instead of two hundred million, or thirty million instead of whatever. Um, but to your point, I think the the second thing, the issue that you raise is really interesting, and I think you're right. I think the 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 premise of all of this is, you know, you trade uh, stability and you know rich benefits package. You know, I mean, Salesforce pays for. IVF, they pay for, you know, like they pay for everything, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and you trade it's that. It's Johanna. It's Johanna. Yeah. So yeah, you're, 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 <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. He's such a saint, that guy. Um, <laughs> he's a, such a nice person. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that the, the premise of all of it is I'll trade all of that for, you know, I'll trade it for opportunity to make an impact and, but also equity. You know, and I think there's more disillusionment about the value of company equity uh, out there in the ecosystem than at any time I've seen. And that's why. And I also think people are saying if I'm going to work a year and a half uh, at some place, nine months at some place before they decide I'm not the right person, I think um, they're going to say, well, why do I need to be a W-2 employee at all? You know, it, maybe it's a better deal for me to rent my expertise instead of outright sell it. And I can have three or four clients. And frankly, I, I think, I don't know that that's a bad outcome. I think what we're going to figure out and and what we're, we're all going to be part of, especially you and me, is what is a company, you know, and, and who needs to be on payroll versus who can be fractional, but provide the right level of expertise. And then maybe when we reach the stage where that person's not as relevant, maybe we swap it out. Now, the, the big thing that's hampering this in the United States is our is is company-based health insurance. 
Mm. And if we had a different kind of healthcare system, I think people would feel much more free to rent their expertise as opposed to sell it uh, to companies. But yeah, I think there's going to be a big shakeout. I think it's still, you know, you can say, oh, it was bad that you, uh, you know, you you uh, pressured, you didn't pressure me, you, you encouraged me to go out on my own. It's still the best thing I've ever done. You know, I still think to be a founder CEO, that's still the best job. It's just being an employee is become harder. It's just become yeah. harder. And that's why it's really important that we try to, we can't just be like, like I said, white knuckling it all next year. We can't just be stressed out and tired and down. We have to find a way to have fun. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I was talking to. Uh, I went for a long walk with a uh, not a long walk. I would cross the street for, to a bar with uh, with, <laughs> with the chief customer officer Mike Sinney. and and we just both got off a, a renewal call that was brutal, right? With separate companies, and you know we ground down and like they're laying off, and it's just like it's doom and gloom. And and and, and look, some of those calls, you know, you empathize and you and you sort of work a plan together with a mutual intent, a mutual co creation of something great. Some other calls that are just like adversarial, but it's like, no, CFO told me to cut 50% of everything. So I got 50% for you or I, dro or I drop. And, you know, I was, I was walking. I'm like, you know, someone's call that you, you don't start a company to not have fun. So this, you know, you, you don't change your life, turn everything upside down, go through really hard times with your families, make some deep sacrifices to not enjoy what you're doing. And what I'm saying, enjoying what you're doing is whatever purpose you, you know, your company has, whatever vision, right. For us is to, you know, empower the 30 million sales professionals out there. So if we're not having fun getting to that mission, then then it's not it's almost not worth doing. So you know, I was I was talking to Zina, I'm like, we should we should recut how we think about customers in terms of, you know, for whom are we driving mutual value, right? For whom are we, you know, are we solving a real problem for which, you know, our the depth of our our knowledge and our technology and all the stuff that, and the and the um, innovation that we're driving is worth it. Because if it's not worth it, then let's just not even engage. And I mean, like, you know, you have, you know, you're, you're a great company and you probably have, you know, great people and you should go find a thing that works for you. But, but, you know, becoming a customer and then just grinding you down after that, it just becomes, you know, especially in a world and that is so complicated, like right now that, you know, deal cycles are longer and, and wind rates are down and then like the economy is still, in, you know, unclear, uh, you, you ha I think that there is uh, there's going to be a capitulation, but also there's going to be an, an awakening of what it's like to really enjoy what you do. And that's going to sort out people and sort out customers and sort out our own businesses. Yeah, I agree with you uh, completely. And I think that, again, you know, everything, the size of all of our companies swelled, you know, uh, mm -hmm. everybody had tons and tons of employees. We, this was post COVID. So many employees I mean, if you graduated from college, you know, around 2020, then you've never worked in an office. You actually haven't been socialized in a way that you have, you, you understand like traditional working standards, yeah. right? So it's like, we all <laughs> so, had- When somebody waves at you, you wave back very, <laughs> very slowly. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to your point, I'm like, so for us, it's like, I'm also recutting the culture because I'm at the point where candidly, I'm like, I just want to work with people that I get energy from and that I like working with. And I, again, I'm not trying to be uh, a mercenary. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just saying that my company, you know, companies have swollen in size or they swollen, they sw they swelled up, whatever the word is, they became much larger. And there was lots of people with lots of different uh, levels of employee engagement. You know, I think we see data that employee engagement's at a low. And I just think like to make it fun, we have to, we, we just have to really be specific on who we want to work with. And we have to really hold a high bar. And I think it will be more fun if we feel really, really good about all of the people that we're surrounded by in our organizations. What kind of, uh, in, in the go-to-market organization, what is the... What is the site profile of the individual and the leader that is going to do well over the next 12 months? And is it the same that we had over the last 10 years? Well, I think it's the, so let's think, I think the general profile is um, there's just so much less room for BS. Right. And so like, uh, this doesn't mean that you still need to learn how to delegate. You still need great leaders that set a vision and that empower their teams. But I just think, 
it's the the bar for at what level you're expected to do some of the work yourself is much later stage than it ever has been. There's much less room for ideas without execution. And um, because there's going to be fewer resources available. So everybody is going to have to pitch in. So I think that that's the kind of leader that's going to be, I don't know that that doesn't necessarily mean a CRO has to, you know, do a lot of individual selling on their own, but they need to be deeply involved. They need to know the pipeline backwards and forwards. They need to have a really keen sense of what's going on. That's number one. And then number two is, you know, it's this, it's kind of like this PL fluency coupled with creativity. It's like, mm -hmm. if you look at your unit economics and they're not working, that does not mean try I, I was at a summit this week and the CRO, who you know, was saying uh, we were doing 100 dials a day and it wasn't working. So I made them do 200. And now we're doing 200 dials a day. <laughs> and I'm like, there's a limit. There's, I don't know that this is the best way to approach it. Like we can't just my phone can only ring so many times a day before it's really not that useful anymore uh, yeah. to do cold calling. I'm not saying cold calling is dead. I'm just saying. There are other channels and other paths to revenue and the creative revenue leader is going to be really open to adopting them and really open to experimentation and really open to understanding and, and, and also messaging to you as the CEO, Manny, that, hey, like, I don't know that I can hit that plan with those growth targets. I can hit this plan. And the benefit of this plan is that it costs half as much. Right. Now we're going to give up 10 points of growth, but it's going to cost half as much. And us as CEOs and founders need to be open to that. The final thing I'll say related to creativity is, it's just who are the people that are really that are really experimenting with new tools and technology. There are so many interesting new tools that are being developed. In some ways, it's sort of like the golden age of the tiny software company. And I think especially the reps, the reps that are creative about social media, the reps that are creative about social selling and co-selling, the reps that are creative about new ways of building workflows, even if it's not like completely contained within an incredible solution like Outreach, the people that are super, super creative, and then of course, highly personalized, but you're just going to have to understand, like, it's hard to be highly, deeply, deeply personalized, deeply consultative at massive, massive scale. It's just hard. So I, I, I think that, you know, there's two things there that, that I, I'm on both sides of the, the argument. I don't think that, that outbound or is, is fundamentally broken. I think that the way we have done in the past is fundamentally broken for sure. Um, and, and sort of like everybody who read predictable revenue thinks that well, if, if all I do is activities, money shows up on the other end. And I don't think that's true. And yes. uh, unfortunately, you know, we've, you know, we've been, we've been, you know, it worked right for a period when, when, when nobody was doing activity, but if everybody does activity, then the customers get overwhelmed. So, so, so I agree with you that it needs to be a better way for you to outline. And, and, and it's, it's interesting because this, this week alone in my own company, I found three instances in which even though we were in a deal, in a conversation, we were not talking about the things that matter to the people, to the person on the other side of the screen or the other side of the, of the phone. And, and it was really interesting to me because in the past, all we had to do was, was sort of like say how we're better and 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 talk feats and speeds and all of a sudden you're you know you're, you're in a purchase cycle right because a 25 year old had the ability to buy two hundred thousand dollars worth of software at any point in time and it, it, clearly that has gone away so and it's interesting because it doesn't take much to to actually get into your buyer's head and and then understand what the problems are especially if you're talking to somebody who belongs into a public company there's plenty of information out there to like go find out you know what 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 that person may be thinking um, just LinkedIn alone is full of like tits and bits that, that you can just take two or three and it's broadly applicable to whoever we're selling. So the, uh, I think that we are moving from a period of which, you know, inbound leads were coming in hot, you know, PLG, PLG used to be the answer to every question, right? Like if you just had a product out there, people will come and use it and you were be swimming in money like data dog. And that doesn't apply anymore. So you have to have some amount of understanding of your customer's business. Uh, understanding of your customers, um, you know, you know, title and career and like what is important to them without getting creepy. And and if you're not using that, you're not selling. And you know what's really interesting? I was reading two books at the same time. I was reading Jolt Effect and Zig Ziglar's uh, The Secrets of Closing uh, at the same time. 
And the jolt effect is literally this is 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 is, is genuinely the, Zig Ziglar's with with a lot of AI talk through it and a lot of like proof points and statistically you know relevant things that were just good old selling you know in the 70s or in the 80s or even in the 90s where you have to understand your your seller psychology you need to understand where they were coming from and you need to have a a very broad arsenal of closing techniques that you have well rehearsed well ahead of the conversation to be able to be successful in this game and all of a sudden we forgot like in the 10 last 10 years it's being about predictable revenue we have on dial 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 you know meeting shows up on the other end and magic happens and 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 i think that to some degree this period is refreshing because it's bringing us back to the core attributes of, of craftsmanship in sales that that we haven't had in the past i agree with you and the only the the caveat or the addendum would be that's really hard what you just described it's hard it's hard to get consistent to consistently get that level of sales execution and sales excellence and we can invest tons and tons and enablement tons and tons and training but the fundamental reality is that not everybody's going to be up to that standard which means that outbound's not broken it's just harder right. right it's just harder and that means that the number of people that are able to do it well is smaller because mm-hmm. it's harder and that obviously has an impact and on our headcount and you know and and how we think about the size of the organizations that we need in order to achieve our growth and that's why again why you know one of the things one of my talk tracks is Hey, like, let's make sure you understand, uh, because one of the numbers, by the way, that has improved, at least based on anecdotal conversations I've had this year, is rep efficiency. Well, why is that? It's because we're sending better leads to a smaller number of people that we trust to close at a higher rate. And so all of a sudden, the smaller number of people are generating more money than a much larger number of people. And I think that's Hopefully that's eye-opening for for people, especially for for people that are building and designing organizations. That I, outbound's not dead; it's just harder. That's right. all. Right. So to close up, what would be the one hot tip that you would give to a CRO today to that will improve him? The the hot tip I would give you, and this is is really the number one. What's the number one uh, gap that I feel most CROs, most VPs of sales? don't have it is PL fluency you have this is a time when you must be able to read an income statement and a balance sheet you must understand the difference between recognized revenue and deferred revenue you must understand how companies keep score when it comes to the income statement so that you can evaluate the efficiency of your efforts because it is no longer the case that you can just go to you manny as the cro i don't know who your cro is but um go to you and say uh, I need 10, I need 50 more SDRs. You, you, you will not have any credibility if right. you cannot articulate the efficiency metrics that underpin how you're going to be allocating capital as a revenue leader. And so you got to spend time doing that. And it cannot just be the CFO is not your adversary. You, they, you need to be on the same side of the table as the CFO. You need to be understanding how every dollar you spend is intended to generate a return. It's not about how your inspirational leadership. It's not about whether or not you bring in, you know, force management or Sandler or Pavilion to help up level your team. It's about your ability to have a sophisticated conversation about efficient growth with the CEO and the board. Hey Amen. What a great, what a great point to end. Uh, well, thank you so much, Sam, for the words of wisdom. As, as you know, you are the. Uh, the industry bartender so you get to you get to hear a lot of you get to hear a lot of every lot damn of- day my brother <laughs> Today, every town needs one so must be you. pull up a chair and tell me your troubles <laughs> will it be the same today <laughs> the usual exactly well, thank you so much for spending the time with me